Good afternoon and happy new year and welcome to the first of our uh, PFF disease education um, webinar series, our first, um, first webinar for 2022. I'm really excited to be here um, and I'm excited that all of you are with us today. Um, I am Amy Hajari Case. I am a senior medical advisor at the PFF for um, education and awareness. And I'm actually going to be doing our presentation today. So um, before we get started, I just wanted to give a couple of housekeeping notes. If you will look at your GoToWebinar control panel, um, I'm probably on the right of your screen, that's where mine is. You can um, drop down the questions tab. And if you have questions, please feel free to submit those there. If we have time um, at the end of our session today, I will try to answer um, some of our questions. And if we can't get to everybody, we will try to circle back with some follow-up um, if, uh, if we're able by email. We also um, have a handout, which is the slides from this, um, this webinar in PDF format. So if you'd like to look at those, um, they are in our handouts tab on your um, control panel as well. So we will, um, we will get started. Our topic today is what is pulmonary fibrosis? This is um, seemed like a good topic for the beginning of the year, just giving an overview um, of a complicated um, subject, just talking a little bit about terminology and what, we're, what, are, what are our doctors really talking about when they're, they're saying these terms and what do we mean? Uh, so an overview today. Um, here are my disclosures. I do have a few relevant research uh, relationships with Genentech, Roche, Bayer, and Gringelheim and United Therapeutics. And I just want to remind everybody that um, any information that I give you today in this presentation is really informational for educational purposes, and it is not a substitute for any medical advice from your medical provider. So um, for any personal questions, I do want you to ask your personal physician or other healthcare provider about your specific medical condition. Okay, so I'm gonna get a little bit into terminology to start with and, um, and talk about some of the alphabet soup a little bit. Um, so, one question is, uh, you know, when, when pulmonary fibrosis comes up, we also hear the term interstitial lung disease, okay? And that can, um, that can sound a little bit confusing. What does that mean? That's a big term. Um, if we think about the, the Venn diagram of lung diseases um, and how pulmonary fibrosis and interstitial lung disease fit into that, um, all, if you think of all types of lung diseases, there may be some that sound more familiar to us, like COPD or like asthma. Um, some of us may have heard of cystic fibrosis, which is very different from the type of pulmonary fibrosis that we're talking about today. Interstitial lung disease is a, is a subcategory of all types of lung disease. They're typically restrictive. We'll talk a little bit more about that, what that means. Um, and they affect the lung tissue, okay? So the spongy part of the lungs. Pulmonary fibrosis is a scarring um, type of interstitial lung disease or a, a grouping of, of um, scarring types of interstitial lung diseases. It's actually not one disease, but it's a group of many diseases that can cause scarring in the lungs. So just to try to get some of the confusion out there, particularly when we go and ask our, ask our um, easy, easiest to access medical professional, Dr. Google, what is pulmonary fibrosis? We're gonna learn a lot about things that may or may not apply to each individual because of some of the confusion with terms. So when we talk about the interstitium or the area between, um, if you look on the left side of this, um, uh, this slide here, um, normal gas exchange. So these, if you think about the lungs as an upside down tree, the leaves are these um, clusters of alveoli or air sacs. They're very thin walled, they're microscopic. And through the wall of the alveolus, oxygen goes out of the lung and into the bloodstream. And they're surrounded by these little tiny, tiny blood vessels that are microscopically small. And carbon dioxide comes out of the bloodstream because we produce carbon dioxide when we live and our tissues work and our muscles work, things like that. And, and the lungs breathe out that carbon dioxide. So if you look at the, the barrier between the alveolus or the air sac and the capillary, the blood vessel, it's very, very thin. But when you think about on the right side um, of this slide, a, um, a, 
a, a lung that has interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis, there is something that is disrupting or widening the distance between the inside of the alveolus or air sac and the inside of that blood vessel. And it's making it harder for the oxygen to get across that membrane and into the bloodstream and out to the body. Um, it's just, it, it creates either inflammation or scarring in that space or sometimes both, and it makes that more difficult. So when you think about what is pulmonary fibrosis, again, we, we also sometimes will hear the term interstitial lung disease, although that Venn diagram doesn't totally overlap. It, it's a problem that occurs in over 200 different types of specific medical conditions or diagnoses. Um, there are some that are limited to the lungs. Um, and we'll talk about you know, what that might look like. There are some that are systemic. We might think about autoimmune or connective tissue diseases, things like rheumatoid arthritis or systemic sclerosis. And some of these are exposure related and these exposures can be myriad, anything from medications that we take, therapies we're exposed to, things in our home environment or things that we're exposed to in our work environment as well. Um, and, and what pulmonary fibrosis as opposed to sort of interstitial lung disease, meaning affecting the, the tissue of the lungs in one way or another. Pulmonary fibrosis refers to the scarring process in the lung tissue, oftentimes progressive for people, um, and can lead to stiffer lungs, um, shortness of breath. And because of the, you know, we saw there with the alveolus, um, the air sacs, the oxygen transfer, low oxygen levels in the blood. So again, occurs in over 200 types of, of diseases. And, and this is a picture of a CT scan. I'll show you a couple more of these um, that's cut, uh, cut in cross section, looking at the lungs um, of somebody who has pulmonary fibrosis. And there are these more gray areas that are a little bit more solid gray are, are more normal. And then these areas that have, um, have these kind of circular changes here are the more fibrotic areas of the, of the lungs on both sides here. So as a medical provider, how do I evaluate interstitial lung disease? Well, all of these components are really helpful. So taking a history, understanding what the patient experiences and what their narrative is, what the timeline is, things like that. Doing a good physical exam for, of that person to understand um, you know, what their lungs sound like, if there's anything outside the lungs that's abnormal, doing some lung function testing to try and define the deficit in the, in the lung function um, and see if it's consistent with one problem or another. Um, imaging, like x-rays and usually CT scans or CAT scans, you might have heard that term, um, are, are more helpful than plain x-rays, but a, a plain x-ray is often easily accessible in an office and, and a good start. We oftentimes do blood testing to look for associated conditions. And sometimes, but not always, do we need biopsies and invasive um, diagnostic procedures. So let's start with a clinical history and why that's so important. I wanna know about what symptoms a person's having, what, how severe they are, when did they start, have they escalated, what other medical problems does a person have, and do they take any medications, and what medications may, have, may they have taken for those problems in the past? Do they have a family history of lung problems and what kind or any other diseases in the family? And then what does their environment look like both at work and at home and with hobbies? So this is Sir William Osler. He is the father of modern medicine and he was one of the greatest diagnosticians to ever wield a stethoscope. But, but short of the stethoscope, he, would, he said, listen to the patient, he is telling you the diagnosis. And so it just makes me remember that, that what the patient says in their narrative is one of the most important things when we're talking about making an accurate diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. So this picture, um, we saw one very similar to it earlier, could be the picture of any of these three patients. The first one, a 34-year-old with systemic sclerosis, which is an autoimmune condition that affects the whole body. The, or a patient whose medications include nitrofurantoin for a recurrent UTI or urinary tract infection. Nitrofurantoin is a medication that is known to, um, to have the possibility of lung damage associated with it. Or a person whose work history includes 15 years in, as, in an asbestos mine. We've heard of asbestosis. That is a scarring disease of the lungs associated with um, asbestos exposure um, and um, toxicity to the lungs or maybe someone who has a pet cocktail in their home and keeps it in their bedroom and, and is exposed to their bird proteins, um, their feather proteins all the time. 
And that can set up um, a, a reaction in the lungs that can be associated with interstitial lung disease um, and pulmonary fibrosis. So this image could fit any one of those histories. And that's why that history is important because those diagnoses are all different. This is a nice flow chart. Um, this is from some uh, American Thoracic Society guidelines. It's very simplified and there are lots more things that could go into it here, but I think this high level view is very nice to look at when I'm thinking about and teaching about um, how we um, diagnose interstitial lung disease. At the top here, it says suspected idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and that's, that, that works for this, but if you suspect any type of pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease, this can also work, okay? So again, that clinical history, understanding what's going on with the patient, really trying to get at an identifiable cause, something that is associated and can be identified that is the cause of the lung problem and the damage to the lungs. And, and that's the first thing I want to know about if, I, if I'm suspecting that somebody has interstitial lung disease. And the answer to that is either yes or no. Now, different types of pulmonary fibrosis we can get different clues in the history. Again, this is a, this is a short list. And this, um, this little table comes from um, some of our Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation website resources. And so I'll use this opportunity just to, um, if, I, if I whet your appetite for um, education at all in this space, um, we have lots of resources on our website that um, will go into more detail about the things that we're just gonna overview today. But this is a, a short list broad topics uh, in terms of types of pulmonary fibrosis or broad categories and some of the clues that we might hear about when we're asking for that patient history. And some of those might be um, different medications that we use, again, things that we're exposed to like mold or different animals, um, inflammation of the joints or skin, um, and, and so on. Now to move on to the physical exam, the things that I want to look for, I usually do a, a relatively um, a thorough look uh, when, we're, when we're talking about a patient that might have interstitial lung disease, but some of the most important things that I want to that I want to assess for, if I think they might have interstitial lung disease, I want to listen to the lungs and listen if I hear crackles. That's kind of a, um, a like it, just like it sounds, a crackling noise, almost if you put your ear over a bowl of Rice Krispies and milk, um, when the patient takes uh, takes a breath in, and I, 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 when I teach um, students, I tell them that they have to listen at the bottom of the lungs because early signs of crackles in the lungs can be missed if we're um, only listening in the anterior or the front, and we're not listening at the bases and the back of the lungs. So those those changes can be subtle. Clubbing of the nails is a is a sign uh, that can be associated with pulmonary fibrosis. It can be normal and it can be associated with other types of, of medical problems, but it is something worth noting because it does happen in a, in a fair number of people that have, um, have pulmonary fibrosis. It's kind of spoon shaped to the, to the nails that can develop over time. The other things you wanna look for are um, evidence of associated conditions. And, and most of those associated conditions that you can see on physical exam are gonna be things that are associated with autoimmune or connective tissue or rheumatologic disease, and those all kind of mean the same thing. So arthritis changes in the fingers that might be associated with rheumatoid arthritis, so small joint arthritis, um, skin changes that might be associated with various, uh, various autoimmune problems, uh, including rash, but also skin thickening and, and things like that, or muscle weakness can be a, can be an even subtle sign of, uh, of an autoimmune problem that needs to be investigated further. So I also wanna know about other types of testing. Pulmonary function tests are, um, I joke, like the fifth vital sign for a pulmonologist. So we wanna know what the function of the lungs is. And some, sometimes it can be diagnostic, meaning we can tell what the deficit is. If it's obstructive, more like an asthma or COPD process, or if it's restrictive, meaning that the volumes of air in the lungs are lower, um, that the oxygen transfer through the lungs is, is maybe limited, and that can give us a clue about which type of lung disease, again, in the group of all lung diseases that we're dealing with. Um, and then over time, those pulmonary function tests are important to, um, in a patient with known pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease, that, that we follow them to understand how they are uh, progressing, responding to therapy, and, and help us understand what we, should, uh, what we should be doing to support that patient. And then, um, uh, also, as part of the initial evaluation, many patients will get blood drawn for lab work, and um, and that would include things like autoimmune 
uh, blood tests, looking for um, looking for antibodies in the blood that are directed against the self or autoimmune that might give a clue to an underlying um, rheumatologic or connective tissue disease. So we'll go back to this um, this uh, flow chart that we had before, and um, then we'll move down to if we if uh, now. Uh, High resolution CT may be important in the yes side of this equation also, but a next step looks like a CAT scan or high resolution CT scan. And high resolution doesn't necessarily mean like a high definition, like a, a um, uh, on your television. It's thin slices. It's it's um, ordered in a certain way, so your doctor needs to know what they're ordering. And the radiology department usually has a protocol for how to do that. And there may be some different maneuvers that um, they might want you to do in getting that CT scan. Um, at least the initial one may be flipping over on the belly or um, breathing not just all the way in, but all the way out um, to take some pictures. And so these are, um, I'll show you a couple of different patterns. Um, this is a nice representation of what we call honeycombing change, honeycomb change. Um, this is a, a fibrotic pattern, meaning that this is really well-established scar tissue that if I was looking directly at the lungs and not on an, not on an x-ray type um, image, I could see that with my naked eye and I did, would not need a microscope to see those changes. And you can see those here, those are those um, little circular changes that are kind of from the outside in. Um, and, uh, it, and since radiologists and pulmonologists sometimes, um, radiologists and pathologists sometimes like to name things after after things they see in the real world, this is they, they refer to this as honeycomb change. Kind of does look like uh, like a, a honeycomb in a beehive. And then some people uh, may have heard the term ground glass, okay, and wondered what that means. Like, do I have glass in my lungs? What is that? What are you even talking about? Um, and and ground glass appearance of the lungs is usually an inflammatory. Um, type of change. It's not always when you look at the um, a biopsy of it, but we most often associate that with an inflammatory change. And you can see there's a big difference here in the way this looks versus what the that more established fibrosis pattern looks. It's a it's a haziness of the lungs. It's kind of that those whitish areas, not the bright white stuff in the middle. That's the heart the white stuff that overlies the lungs on the sides there. And, and if you look at a ground glass, it's something that uh, that you you can see light through it, but you cannot you cannot read a newspaper through it. And so that's kind of a, a haziness that uh, that that you can see, but it doesn't obliterate the underlying structures of the lungs. And again, it's a more inflammatory type pattern um, in the lungs. It's just something that we see on um, on a, a CT image and that's how it's described. It doesn't mean that there's, there's glass in the lungs. I've heard people have questions about that before. Okay, now we've talked about some of those, turning some of those cards face up on the table. There are some people for whom all of the stuff that we've talked about so far will lend itself to a diagnosis, a specific diagnosis that doesn't necessarily require any additional information. I like to tell patients that you know, it's not one thing or another thing that's definitely going to give us the answer here. But if you think of yourself or your patient as a puzzle and you can get enough pieces of the puzzle put together to kind of tell what the picture is going to look like, you may not need to put any more pieces in place. But sometimes you have a few pieces down and that's your history, that's your exam, that's your testing, that's your CAT scan, but you're still not really sure what the picture is of. And in that case, we need to start thinking about what additional information can we get what other pieces can we put in that puzzle to try to figure out what the picture is, okay, and make a diagnosis? And in some cases, a biopsy um, then becomes appropriate. Now, we can biopsy the lungs in a couple of different ways. Um, the, uh, one of the more common ways of doing this is via bronchoscopy. Um, so a bronchoscope is, uh, some of you may have had a bronchoscopy before. A bronchoscope is a long, thin fiber optic camera that looks down in the lungs, either through the nose or through the mouth, down into the lungs, and takes a look around. Most of the time, all we're seeing is the inside of the bronchial tubes, not looking directly at the tissue. But what we're trying to get is small pieces of tissue that can be sent to a pathologist, maybe for cultures, maybe for different types of testing that can give us information about what's going on in the lung tissue, not necessarily in the airways themselves. There are um, a limited number of things that can, uh, for which the diagnosis can be made by bronchoscopy. Those um, tissue samples are generally really small 
um, and, and not always sufficient for making a diagnosis in interstitial lung disease. Um, but sometimes it is useful in that, that um, we do, you know, we do sometimes employ this um, in the right patient. And that is generally an outpatient procedure. You know, it's uh, people go to sleep, they wake up, they go home, they're back to their regular activities the, um, the next day in general. Now, a surgical lung biopsy gives us slightly bigger pieces of tissue and uh, can sample multiple lobes of the lung um, on, on one side. Um, and uh, most often now is done via a, a videoscope through the side of the chest wall, small incisions. So if you've ever heard of a laparoscopic surgery, somebody had their gallbladder out with a laparoscopic surgery, um, rather than cutting that person's belly wide open, they, um, they put small holes and put a camera in one and some tools in the other, and then they took the gallbladder out through that. Similar technology, we call this a thoracoscopic um, surgery, meaning a VAT surgery, V-A-T-S, a video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery, meaning that we put a camera in one hole, we put some tools in the others, and make small incisions where the surgeon's hands don't have to go all the way in the chest, um, but we can use those tools to get small biopsy pieces, get what we need, and make small incisions um, with less time to recovery, less risk, and things like that. It's still um, not a small procedure for people. It is general anesthesia. Um, for in most locations, it's um, at least one night in a hospital and um, oftentimes a chest tube uh, left in place afterwards until, um, until the lung is completely healed. Um, usually that's a short period of time. It does give us lots of valuable information. Um, and that, uh, that information is uh, what we see here. Um, these small uh, pieces of tissue are made into um, pathology slides. And we look at those under the microscope, the pathologist does, and they, they um, then report back uh, what they're seeing under the microscope. But these are just some different patterns um, that are sometimes seen under the microscope. The top left here is a normal looking lung. You wouldn't necessarily have guessed that just by looking at it. On the right there is a, is a patient with pulmonary fibrosis. The bottom left is a much more inflammatory pattern as is the one on the bottom right there. Um, so what's really important about getting all of these pieces of information together is when the different people who know most about these areas, the clinician, the, the physician that saw a patient in the clinic, talked to them, examined them, the pulmonologist in most cases, the radiologist who is an expert at looking at CAT scans and interpreting what they mean, and the pathologist, the expert at looking at those slides and making sense of, of those pink and blue images we saw there, get together and they talk about all the aspects of those things and they try to put together, um, you know, sometimes it's a little arm wrestling, uh, but the best fit diagnosis for that patient, okay? And that's what you call a multidisciplinary discussion. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit more specifically about one of the things that is one of the most common of our interstitial lung diseases, and that is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I want to make sure that we understand here that there is a difference between idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and I mean, IPF is the, the term we often use, um, is a very specific, one very specific diagnosis among all of the other couple hundred interstitial lung diseases. Mm -hmm. So because a person has interstitial lung disease does mm -hmm. not automatically yes. mean that they have IPF. And that can sometimes be confusing, particularly as um, many of our internet resources are not very nuanced. Um, and they don't necessarily, they, they can't necessarily differentiate what you're asking for when you ask about one or the other of these things. There are other types of diseases that lead to fibrosis in the lungs that are not idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Sometimes they behave similarly and sometimes they behave differently. And this is why um, having, having a good understanding of what's going on in the lungs, what the process is, the disease behavior over time is also very important. Now, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a, is a chronic interstitial lung disease. And sometimes you'll hear the, the term interstitial pneumonia, and we think, oh, this is an infection. Pneumonia in this case, and in the pathological terms, doesn't necessarily mean infection. It just means something's wrong with the lungs, okay? Infectious pneumonias, we typically hear about that. Somebody had pneumonia, they went to the hospital. It was probably an infection, but in this case, this is more of a pathology term. But it is, a, is, it is an interstitial lung disease. It is chronic. It is progressive, um, I, sometimes slowly and sometimes quickly. It is lung limited, meaning that idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis 
is just belongs to the lungs, okay? It, it's not a systemic condition. Now it can make us feel ways in the rest of our body, but um, because of the impact the lungs have on the rest of the body, but it is, it is not associated with any systemic or outside the lungs condition. Um, and in general, while we know some of the risk factors that make it make it more likely for a person to have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, when we say idiopathic, we mean that there's not like one specific thing that we know this caused that. For example, in maybe rheumatoid arthritis with pulmonary fibrosis, well, that rheumatoid arthritis probably caused the pulmonary fibrosis, and that's a distinct identifiable etiology uh, or cause. But in this case, there isn't one that's associated. But I'll tell you in a second, we know a fair amount about some of the risk factors, even though um, they may not lead directly to disease process. Typically, IPF occurs in older adults, but certainly it can happen in younger people, particularly in families. And it is associated with a very specific pattern of fibrosis, UIP. Boy, this sounds like alphabet soup now, doesn't it? Usual interstitial pneumonia is a pattern of lung injury. That fibrosis pattern I showed you earlier on the, on the pathology as well as on the radiology, so CT and biopsy, is, is the pattern of lung injury. And that's associated with um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It is, um, it is not the, uh, it, IPF is not the only thing that can have that type of lung injury pattern, however. So it can, like I said, it gets really confusing. That's why we gotta put heads together to make the right diagnosis. When I say that IPF is progressive, this is what I mean. Most people will experience some sort of progression. A minority of people will have relative stability. They might lose just a little bit of lung function over time. There are, again, another minority of people who will have very rapid progression. Their lung function uh, will drop off very quickly um, at, at, from time of diagnosis to um, over time. And then kind of everybody else falls somewhere in the middle, which is generally how life is. Um, but they'll be slowly, but generally progressive, um, losing, uh, losing, you know, some amount of lung function that's measurable and perceivable over, um, over time. And I note here that I don't have specific time points on this, right? Because everybody is different. So I don't want anybody to take this home and say, well, where am I on this timeline? Because everybody is different. Now, even the more stable patients are at risk for these little lightning bolts. And we call those acute exacerbations or acute episodes of respiratory worsening, meaning that things get worse kind of on the short term in maybe just a few days or weeks. Things get, things get pretty bad and people feel more short of breath. They need more oxygen than they had before. Their lung function deteriorates pretty quickly. Sometimes it requires a hospitalization. Um, and sometimes people don't recover from those events as well. So those, again, we call acute exacerbations. Now, I told you, we know some risk factors for um, IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And these are some risk factors that we might see for other types of interstitial lung disease as well. But cigarette smoking, different environmental exposures, um, it, some infections, um, some uh, um, uh, herpes virus infections have been associated, other types of microbial um, or um, uh, agents or uh, infections, the microbiome has been associated with IPF. Um, gastroesophageal reflux disease is uh, a known risk factor for IPF, but let's use that as an example. So lots of people have reflux, right? But not everybody has IPF, not everybody has interstitial lung disease. So it is a risk factor. It is not necessarily a direct cause um, for the disease. And, and also I mentioned um, genetics or family history of, um, of interstitial lung disease can, and, or you know, IPF um, can also be a risk factor for development of disease as well. So a last little word here on um, some terminology. And I, I mentioned this, this UIP or usual interstitial pneumonia pattern. This is a lung injury pattern. We can see it on a CT scan. We can see it under the microscope. And it's just a pattern of chronic lung injury that is a scarring pattern. Um, even though it was first described uh, pathologically, meaning under the microscope, it does have a correlate on um, CAT scan, but it's not a clinical diagnosis. So if somebody has this pattern, why do they have it? Um, if, if there's not a direct cause, again, we, it, it is then um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but if there's an associated etiology for that, we can find the thing that injured the lung or the reason that the lung was injured, then that is, um, that is the clinical condition. So not all UIP is IPF, but 
IPF should have the, the um, pathology or, or CT correlative UIP as that injury pattern. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit to what should we be doing. This is an overview. Um, so I know we may have some people that are hungry to, um, for, for more information, um, more of these details about the different types of lung diseases, the, um, you know, the different pathology and associated um, conditions. Uh, there is lots more in, uh, information on that on the PFF website um, for you to peruse at your leisure. I am going to switch gears now and talk a little bit about what do we do about these things. Okay. So first, you are taking the right step now, get informed. And, you know, obviously I'm very biased, but I think the PFF is a, um, a fabulous resource for this. Um, there are others, Rare Connect, the Chest Foundation, um, the American Thoracic Society, Society's um, PAR group uh, are, have wonderful patient-facing um, education on um, pulmonary fibrosis. Um, through the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation, there are a number of support groups that are um, focused on different uh, individuals that are living with pulmonary fibrosis in different parts of their lives. So for caregivers, for patients, for people who have had lung transplants, uh, we even have a Spanish language uh, uh, telephone-based support group. Um, we have the health center. There are local support groups um, around the country that, that people can participate in. So getting informed is the, the best first way to start. Now, number two, if your oxygen levels are low, you may need to use some oxygen. It's, uh, it is a lifestyle change. Um, it is not always easy. The purpose is not to tie a person down, but to help them be able to do more with what they have um, and have the lungs not be as limiting as they, they might be if the, lung, if the oxygen levels were low to the body. Now, pulmonary fibrosis, um, it, oxygen use in pulmonary fibrosis has not been well studied. We, we kind of extrapolate from some of the COPD literature, but we think it does decrease or prevent some of the shortness of breath that happens when oxygen levels get low. It can decrease the risk of a complication called pulmonary hypertension, which is high blood pressure in the lungs, um, can lower the heart rate, can help increase activity level or facilitate better activity and exercise and maintaining a, a level of functionality that would, people would be happy with, and uh, can improve the quality of sleep um, if needed at night. All right, next up, uh, you may have heard about um, something called pulmonary rehabilitation. And sometimes we'll, uh, we'll get fast in our terminology and say pulmonary rehab. What does that mean? So pulmonary rehabilitation is a structured exercise program for patients with chronic lung problems, okay? Um, and that doesn't always include, that, that's not always uh, pulmonary fibrosis. You might be in a class, a uh, pulmonary rehabilitation class with people with COPD or other types of lung, uh, lung um, problems. But many of the same components of pulmonary rehabilitation can help all types of patients with lung problems. Exercise training is really only one component of that, but they do use, um, uh, uh, you saw some bikes there, treadmills, recumbent bikes, um, aerobic exercise with as much oxygen as is required to facilitate doing that. There's some outcome assessments. So how are people doing with their exercise? Are they progressing? Some respiratory muscle training, um, some breathing techniques, um, it's like a social support there. Um, they're often associated with support groups um, in the locations where they are too. Nutrition evaluation and counseling. So they do have nutrition and um, a nutritionist is associated with, uh, with those pulmonary rehab programs. And education on disease states, on um, the exercise that they're doing, oxygen, uh, preventive care, and things like that are all those components of pulmonary rehab. And so there are lots of benefits for pulmonary rehab, um, increasing exercise capacity, reducing symptoms, better quality of life and energy, and some self-management skills that people will, um, will uh, learn while they're there. And we do have uh, on the website a lot of information about pulmonary rehabilitation. There is a uh, pulmonary rehabilitation toolkit there um, that you can see under the Understanding PF and Treatment Options um, uh, tab on our website. This actually has some videos that uh, you can follow along with at home um, that can show you some of the things that we would do in a pulmonary rehabilitation program that you can translate into your own environment, particularly if um, a pulmonary rehab isn't right for you right now, or if you're too far away from, from one, um, or if you're maybe um, at reduced capacity because of the pandemic. So 
preventive care. So an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So we want to make sure that we're protecting ourselves and thinking about all of the other things that can go on that, that, don't, that aren't necessarily pulmonary fibrosis. So if you smoke, don't. That's, that's all I would say about that. Vaccines are really important. We hear a lot about COVID vaccinations right now, and those are incredibly important for our pulmonary fibrosis community, but also flu vaccines every year, getting our pneumonia shots up to date if they're not. Um, even, uh, you know, even shingles vaccinations, just to make sure that we're covered from a preventive care standpoint, maintaining a healthy weight and a healthy lifestyle, and I also just making sure that our other medical problems are taken care of because we don't want to forget about our blood pressure, about our hearts, about any diabetes and things like that that we might have just because we've got pulmonary fibrosis. So let's talk a little bit about lung transplantation. Um, that is an option for some people um, should they progress to, um, to severe uh, lung dysfunction with pulmonary fibrosis. Now, it's important to note that there is a strict evaluation process. There's criteria for um, that a person should meet before becoming a transplant candidate. There's lots of medical testing that goes along with that. There is a committee that then reviews um, each individual who's seeking a transplant. If that person is deemed a suitable candidate who seems like they're somebody who could be helped and not harmed by the transplant process, they will go on a waiting list. And the lungs become available based on a lung allocation score. And this is a severity of illness score. So the most sick people will go to the top of that list um, it's not simply the time uh, that they wait on the list. Now, um, the transplant procedure itself is a, is a pretty big surgical procedure, and that's why a lot of that medical testing takes place to make, make sure a person is fit to be able to go through such a big procedure. Um, and then afterwards, there's a lot of recovery and rehabilitation that has to take place, sometimes a prolonged hospitalization, sometimes relocating to be closer to the transplant center so they can have close care taken up. Um, of them. And then after transplant, it's not necessarily the miracle cure that somebody might think about. It is a great thing when it goes well, but it is a, it is something that has to be maintained. So you're not, you know, free and clear, never have to think about it again. People who get lung transplants do have to take medications to prevent re, um, rejection episodes for the rest of their lives. Um, but those people do experience better symptom, uh, improved symptoms, better oxygen levels. Many of them come completely off of oxygen and, um, and have, uh, you know, have a big change in their lives um, as well as pro, um, improving their, their survival after transplant. Now, remember when I said this is for, um, for few people, um, if you can see the impact of the number of people in the US that are living with um, pulmonary fibrosis, those that die each year with pulmonary fibrosis, the number of new diagnoses we make each year and the number, this is a little bit of old data, but the number of transplants that were done for pulmonary fibrosis in 2018 was less than less than a thousand. So um, there are a couple of limitations there, meaning not everybody is going to be a candidate for a lung transplant because of um, factors related to the patient and the risk um, and benefit balance associated with transplant itself. Um, versus also that lungs are not, uh, they don't unfortunately grow on trees. And so um, the supply of organs is um, is not what we would like it to be. We can't help everybody who is even on the list for transplant. Um, palliative care uh, is something that um, I think a lot of people associate directly with hospice care, but it is not. And I want to just speak for a minute about that. Palliative care is such an important component of taking care of anybody with a chronic illness, particularly one that affects the way um, a person's lungs function. Um, and this is a quote from the Center to Advance Palliative Care about what palliative care is. But to me, it's a supportive type of care. It is taking care of the whole person um, it, with supportive types of things, thinking about symptoms and all the other things that a person with um, lung fibrosis can suffer with um, as they're dealing with their disease. It is not only for end of life, okay? It is not only for the last weeks and months of a person's time on earth. It is, it, it, we really should be thinking about how we're supporting the patient from the time of diagnosis and making sure that we're dealing with um, their needs, not just um, some of the disease specific things. So palliative care is not hospice care. 
Um, but hospice care is part of palliative care. So I have a lot of Venn diagrams in this, um, this hour here, but if you think about what palliative care is, it can overlap with medications that are specific to the disease, life prolonging treatment. Um, it has to do with symptom management and hospice is a subset of palliative care that happens at end of life, um, but, it is, uh, but they're not exactly the same thing. Now, if you think about this, it's a little bit complicated, but I'm just gonna boil it down to the fact that if you think about early in disease, soon after diagnosis, when things are um, much more manageable, chronic, but earlier in onset, and we're talking about treating the things that can help prolong life and, and directly affect the disease process, that can happen at the same time as we're thinking about palliative care and supportive care and symptom management um, for a person. And as disease progresses, we might think and lean more on those symptom management, supportive care types of interventions, and less on things that are life prolonging to end of life where we think about um, the, the last stages of life in hospice. And thinking about our advanced care planning, our goals of care early on in a disease process is really important in understanding what it is we're trying to get um, out, of, out of our time. Now, patients with lung fibrosis don't just deal with shortness of breath, that's the obvious thing, but there are lots of other things that impact their quality of life, and that includes cough, fatigue and deconditioning, anxiety and depression that can go along with having a chronic illness that's progressive, um, as well as shortness of breath. And there are things that we do that are medication related and there are other non-medication interventions um, that we might consider for our patients that are experiencing those symptoms that impact quality of life. Um, moving quickly to um, some of the comorbidities that we think about that we can't forget about with, um, with pulmonary fibrosis, and I have here IPF, but this could be other types of interstitial lung disease, obstructive sleep apnea, reflux we mentioned, um, it's very common in, in pulmonary fibrosis. Lung cancer occurs at an increased um, uh, incidence in patients with IPF. Uh, I mentioned also pulmonary hypertension. And people who have um, uh, pulmonary fibrosis can also get emphysema and COPD, so you can have two things. It's important not to forget those. This is, um, again, a little bit complicated, but we talk about Reflux is um, something that is um, common in and a risk factor for pulmonary fibrosis. It can also, um, if uncontrolled, potentially help drive disease progression. So if that is there, um, we should definitely address it. Now, if a person has sleep apnea, it should be treated. And the, the best way to treat that is with positive um, airway pressure therapy or CPAP, sometimes BiPAP for those patients. I will tell you, um, without getting into too much about sleep apnea itself, it's very common in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, it, this was a, um, a study done by Lisa Lancaster and published in the Chess Journal. 88%, um, if I'm doing my math correctly, 88% of patients with IPF in that cohort had some type of sleep apnea. Um, most of them had moderate to severe sleep apnea, and our usual screening tools for sleep apnea actually don't do very well for patients with pulmonary fibrosis. So we really have to be thinking about it um, because it can uh, worsen outcomes in patients with pulmonary fibrosis. We really need a sleep study to make a diagnosis and it should be treated um, to help with that. Now, we also wanna think about pulmonary hypertension. Um, this is high blood pressure in the lungs. And um, I suspect this when patients have a change in their oxygen requirement, their functional status changes, or they have low diffusion capacity, which is one of our pulmonary function test measurements. Sometimes we'll use an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart. Sometimes a right heart catheterization, which is an intervention, a cath catheterization lab procedure. We put a catheter into the, um, into the blood vessels and measure pressures. And this can be really tricky to manage. It is definitely not a one size fits all type of um, type of proposal here. So a, a, a specialist that has experience in, in managing pulmonary hypertension, um, particularly in interstitial lung disease should be involved in the um, management of this situation. I talked a little bit about advanced care planning, but I just wanna mention kind of what are our goals of care. And when we think about goals of care, in a person with a chronic, potentially progressive illness, I want to talk about symptom management. I want to talk about the, the person's goals, what their goals are with, for themselves and with their family. 
um, not just cold status. I think somebody, some people might hear about that in the hospital. Do you want to be on a ventilator? Do you want CPR? That's what we talk about, cold status, but that's not everything here. We really want to talk about how one wants to live their life and, and then also talk about what specific therapies do they feel are acceptable and congruent with how they want to live. So that could be a really huge conversation all by itself. Um, but kind of putting these things together, all of these pieces of the puzzle are really important in managing and supporting patients with interstitial lung disease across all of those myriad different types of specific diagnoses, okay? Now, I know we're gonna have a lot of questions about specific treatments, because when we talk about treatment, um, we really think mostly about med medicines. What kind of medicines can I get? What kind of treatments are out there? Um, and I'm gonna be a little bit more um, broad based in my discussion here and very brief because there is so much um, individual, is in, in individualizing, it's probably not a good word, um, but an individual aspect to how people are treated. And that has a lot to do with the pattern of lung injury, the specific diagnosis, and also the behavior of their disease over time. Well, I like to think about these interstitial lung diseases on kind of a spectrum. Some of them are very fibrotic, meaning scarring and scarring only. A paradigm for that would be idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or inflammatory. Some of them are highly and only inflammatory, some of the autoimmune conditions, things like that. And many have aspects of both, somewhere in between. Um, and, and how a person's disease behaves and what their pattern is um, kind of dictates how, um, how an ILV specialist might manage that patient. Now, you may have heard of antifibrosis medications. Um, they, the two that are approved by the FDA are nintedinib and perfenidone, and they are indicated in different um, types of interstitial lung disease. Uh, they are both indicated for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, we also utilize for those that have a very inflammatory um, type process, immune suppression. Sometimes that means steroids, and sometimes that means other types of immune suppressive medications that are not steroids. Um, and, and some of you may have experienced that as well. Um, many of those are used in autoimmune diseases, and some of them are um, people might be familiar with those because some of them are used in transplant as well to suppress the immune system to pre prevent rejection. Important in, um, in across this spectrum is avoidance of any further injury, particularly if one can identify something that has been an exposure or medication that's injurious to the lungs, um, mitigating that, removing that offending exposure, changing the environment, something like that to try to prevent further damage from happening to the lungs if at all possible. And again, that's very general because this is a, um, you know, this, this can be in an individualized conversation. Now, the last thing I'm going to cover is um, clinical trials. Uh, these are research studies. Clinical trials are research studies done um, in people with a disease to try and find um, better treatments um, and understand more about the disease process. So our anti-fibrosis medications are known to slow disease progression in, uh, in those fibrotic types of interstitial lung disease, um, but they don't stop it for most people and they don't reverse it. And so we need something better. Similarly, immunosuppressive medications don't work the same way for everybody. And some of them, you know, some people may get a really great response to their immunosuppressive medications and others don't necessarily get the same, uh, the same exuberant response to that. And so we need to do better in those areas as well. Um, these scientific studies of clinical trials advance our treatments for pulmonary fibrosis and interstitial lung disease. We study new medications. We study old medications used in new and different ways for new, um, for new indications or delivered in different ways. We study, study other types of therapies that are not necessarily medications that we take, but interventions that we, um, we provide to people um, such as pulmonary rehabilitation or oxygen. There are other types of therapies um, that, uh, that are used in, in pulmonary fibrosis that are not medicines. And then sometimes it's just data collection. So registry studies, you may have heard a little bit about the um, Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation registry, which is uh, um, just a way of collecting data, which anybody here could be a participant in when it opens later this year, um, to collect data to help us understand more about the disease process 
by watching and observing and collecting data without necessarily intervening um, uh, in that process. It helps us learn so much about, um, about the, the biological processes and, and the clinical behavior and things like that. Now, um, how do we do that? It improves our understanding and we use these studies um, again, for treatments to understand whether they're safe and effective, we go through different stages um, of, um, of studies and um, you know, different levels of the interventions. So you may have heard the term double blind study. I really like this cartoon. Um, and I always uh, think about it when I hear about a double blind study. But that's just one of the different types of clinical trials that are going on um, for uh, pulmonary fibrosis. And since it's beyond the scope of our discussion today, I would direct you to um, some great information we have on the PFF website. Um, our Clinical Trials Education Center um, is under our uh, medical support and resources. Uh, it has a lot of information about the basics of clinical trials, about the different phases of clinical trials, and you can even find on our website different clinical trials that are, um, that are going on in pulmonary fibrosis right now and find them close to you if you're at all interested in participating in them. So really great resource. You could spend a really long time just delving into this topic all by itself. All right, so I am gonna open my question panel and see if we have any questions. Um, so I have a question here about um, kind of time frame um, about being on medicines and how long you, you need to be on them to know if they are working. And that is actually a trickier question than you might think. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of response, I think that the answer to that is how do we decide if somebody is, is responding to their medication and how they're responding. Um, generally, that looks like testing. Um, I also think that talking to people about their symptoms and how they're feeling, how they're tolerating those medicines is really important. But we lean very heavily on lung function testing and comparing them to the person's previous pulmonary function testing to see how they have changed or stayed the same. And it really depends on what the expectation is for those medications. So if we're expecting to see um, that the result of medication is stability or slowing of, of change, slowing decline, or perhaps improvement in those lung function tests, then that's kind of what we're gonna be measuring over time to see how people respond. In general, I think three months is kind of the shortest time frame. I would be looking at those tests again, um, up to six months. We have some guidelines that suggest that three to six month um, evaluation of lung function tests is, um, is an, are, a, an appropriate range of time frame for people to be reevaluated. Um, and then also sometimes, depending on um, you know, what's going on in the lungs, we might look at additional imaging with a repeat CT scan for comparison as well. And that's a, an individual um, you know, decision to, based on what your doctor is um, ex expecting and, um, and looking for. I do have a question about um, post-COVID pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and whether the progression uh, is expected to be the same as um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or pulmonary fibrosis from other causes, I think a lot of that's not known yet. Um, there, um, you know, if you look back at the, um, uh, when COVID causes um, ARDS, I think you might be able to go back and look at some of the older um, uh, ARDS literature, so severe lung injury, um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and, um, and see that Many of those patients don't develop progressive fibrosis um, and uh, may, you know, may not may not behave similarly. Um, many of them don't behave similarly to IPF patients. But I think it still remains to be seen what the risk factors are um, for progressive disease with um, with COVID uh, related lung disease. Um, on what time frame can we make that diagnosis? What are the features? What are the risk factors? And then what do we do about that? Because I think that's something that's also um, also not fully understood yet. Um, all right, I'm gonna pop through a couple more of these. Let's see what our time looks like. Um, so I have a question about um, recommending um, lung transplantation in IPF. Um, uh, it is definitely a consideration um, at, at potentially even as early as time of diagnosis for patients with IPF. Um, because we know that it it uh, it tends to be a progressive 
um, disease. There are patients who progress much more quickly than others. And so we may not have a, um, a big open window for making that referral to, um, to lung transplant evaluation. And the evaluation process does take time. The lung transplant list and waiting on it actually takes time as well. Plus, I also tell people that um, you know, there is sort of a window of opportunity for patients with pulmonary fibrosis who are eligible for lung transplant. Our transplant uh, teams don't want to, um, to put a patient through a transplant procedure too early where they're not sick enough to get to be transplanted, but they don't want to wait too late until they're too sick for, to be able to tolerate and get through a transplant procedure and actually benefit from it. So having that conversation with your doctor early um, is important. Um, understanding that timeline on which um, that, that uh, referral should happen um, and, uh, and keeping those options open for those patients um, who feel like that may be something um, that they, they might want to pursue. All right. Um, I have another question about um, tests that uh, we might do to measure rate of progression. And so again, I think I would go back to um, the lung function test. I think that, um, you know, I, CT scans imaging can be helpful, um, but it's not necessarily telling you what, um, how a person is experiencing their, um, their lung disease and how they are functioning. And so um, typically, like I said, I lean very heavily on lung function testing. When we look back to our clinical trials um, and how we measure lung function and progression in clinical trials, that tends to um, be primarily with lung function, mostly the forced vital capacity, which is one of our lung function measurements. We also use diffusing capacity, which is the oxygen transfer, um, gas exchange type of measurement. Um, walk uh, assessment, so oxygenation and distance walked during a six minute walk test can actually be very helpful as well. Um, in particularly if you're looking at that next to a previous test and kind of assessing for what, um, what changes in that function as well. So I think those are, um, you know, those over time can be very helpful at looking at um, response to therapy as well as, um, as, well as progression. Um, the, uh, oh, and this is a great transition because we are um, almost out of time. Um, and I wanted to make sure uh, to, um, to tell you a couple of things. One uh, was uh, the, answering this question, will the recording be available after the meeting? Yes, uh, not totally immediately because I think they may um, edit uh, um, for you know, beginning and end, um, but it will be posted um, on, our, um, on our YouTube uh, channel and uh, there'll be notification out there that, that, that this is available and you can go back and review. I'll also remind you that if you have not done so already and would like to, you can go to the handouts tab on your control panel, pull down these um, slides in PDF format um, for you to look over and, um, and review as well. And, um, and then finally, um, when we end this session today, we're going to, um, you're going to have pop up a, um, an option to give us uh, some feedback in a very short survey. You will not get an email later to ask for feedback. So this is your opportunity to um, tell, us, um, tell us about um, how you felt about this um, session today and get some feedback for our future planning. Um, finally, I'd like to thank you all for, um, for joining us today. And for all your great, great questions, we'll do our best to follow up with everybody we couldn't get to um, during the session today. And um, and happy new year! And we will see you at our next um, at our next webinar. Have a great afternoon, everybody.